All right, so we're ready to talk about our next lab here. And in this lab, we're going to just go over some basic information on animal architecture and development. <coughs> Excuse me. This is going to be some uh, information that we're going to use the rest of the semester as we learn about the different animal phyla. And it's just some important vocabulary terms and things um, that help us when we do our dissections, when we try to look at these phyla. And it helps us to understand the evolutionary relationship among all these different groups. So let's get started. We're going to talk about animal body plans and symmetry briefly. And then we're going to talk about animal development. And then uh, maybe a little bit about how we can use that to um, classify organisms. So um, when we talk about symmetry first, we just need to talk about some vocabulary here. Uh, some different ways that organisms or animals can be symmetrical. And so um, it's very rare, but we have something called spherical symmetry. And that means any plane that goes through the center, no matter what orientation, will always make mirror images. This is very uncommon. Um, a little bit more common is radial symmetry. Radial symmetry um, is for organisms that have a top and a bottom um, but no left and right, or no clearly identifiable left and right, but a clearly identifiable top and bottom. Bilateral symmetry, um, which is what you know you are, humans are, are bilater bilaterally symmetrical. You have a top and a bottom plus a left and a right. And when you have bilateral symmetry, um, this makes it much easier to have directional movement. So Organisms with bilateral symmetry can like move towards something or move away something from something. They can they can easily have a direction. So consequently, you often see cephalization or the formation of a head when you have organisms that have bilateral symmetry. Um, so here is just an example of spherical symmetry. And so if you take a plane, no matter what orientation that plane is, if it goes through the center you're always going to make mirror images. Not very common. Here at the top is an example of radial symmetry. And so you can see that these objects have a top and a bottom that's clearly identifiable, but you don't have a, a left and a right. At the bottom, you have some objects that have bilateral symmetry. And so these things have both a top and a bottom and a left and a right. You'll notice in these uh, examples here, they've shown some different planes that bisect these organisms. And if you, if you have radial symmetry, any vertical plane will make mirror images. And so you have an infinite number of vertical planes. And so that's why you don't really have a left and a right. But with bilateral symmetry, there's only one vertical plane that will make mirror images. OK, um, so. Along this line, we also want to talk about some more vo vocabulary that will help us describe animals. And you've got these different planes that um, can bisect an animal. And so um, in a bilaterally sym symmetrical organism, the sagittal plane is the only plane that will make mirror images. Um, the sagittal plane is the plane that separates the organism into left and right halves. The transverse plane is also called a cross-section. And the transverse plane will separate the animal into the anterior and the posterior halves. And then finally, the frontal plane is the plane that separates the organism into a front and back. And these are, again, um, things that work mostly with bilaterally symmetrical organisms, but they can work with any organism. Uh, some other vocabulary that you're going to need to know when we're describing animals. Medial means the midline. It's toward the middle of the organism. Lateral means the sides or out toward the edges, uh, away from the midline. Distal is farther from the middle. Proximal is closer to the middle. And then uh, if we're talking about vertebrates, we also have some other terms. The anterior appendages are the pectoral appendages and the posterior appendages are the pelvic appendages. So just think of where your pecs are and where your pelvis is, and it'll help you remember that. 
Okay, so those are just some terms that we're going to be using um, throughout the semester. Let's spend the rest of the lecture talking about animal development. And so looking at embryology and how animals develop, it, it's basic, important information for understanding animals. I mean, this class is about understanding animals. And so how you can get this multicellular complicated organism that begins as a single cell, that's both interesting and important. Um, also, by studying embryology, this helps us understand how animals develop which helps us understand how they're related and how they evolved. And so you can look at two organisms that as adults look very different, but when you look at their development, you see that they develop in a similar manner. That suggests that they have a recent common ancestor and they're more closely related uh, to each other than they are to other animals. And so that's one of the reasons that we're going to talk about development in this class. Now, embryology is a huge topic, and you could literally do an entire semester on embryology. Uh, but we're going to just learn enough here to help us understand how we group the different animal phyla. And so here's a figure from your book, and it's kind of showing um, different stages of the development of an organism, starting with a single cell fertilized egg that develops into a multicellular um, larvae which eventually metamorphosizes into a multicellular adult. What we're going to do um, for this lecture is we're going to zoom in on this part of the diagram. So we're going to look at these stages of development, which is um, when you've got several cells that have developed, um, but you have not quite developed into a full, a full identifiable larvae. And so this is the blastula stage and the uh, gastrula stage. So here's another figure from your book, um, kind of showing this development. And so the blastula is a hollow ball stage. And so you've got many cells, but they are a hollow sphere, like a ball. And that hollow center is called the blastocele. And so at some point, as the organism develops and produces more cells, the blastula undergoes gastrulation. And, I, and this is when part of that hollow cell, that hollow ball, starts to fold in and to form a cavity, another cavity inside that developing organism. And at this point, we call it a gastrula. And so you undergo gastrulation to form a gastrula. Um, and so when this happens, the developing embryo is forming several different germ layers. So you're starting to see the cells differentiate into different types of cells. Remember, all your, you know, you, every one of you started as a single cell. And then that cell divided and those cells divided and those cells divided. But if you look at you now, you've got very different cells. You've got skin cells, and you've got eye cells, and you've got stomach and heart cells, and you've got toe cells. But they all started from a single cell. So at some point during the development of an animal, those cells have to start differentiating. They, you know, they have to start turning into this cell is, all, is going to become a cardiac cell, and this cell is going to become a toe cell or whatever. And so that really starts to happen at this stage in development. You're starting to see the, the cells differentiate into three different germ layers. And those germ layers are called the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. And so, again, these are prefixes that you're going to see a lot in this class. Endo means inside. So the endoderm is the inside layer. And you can see that on this on this figure here. Uh, let me pull up the pen and I can circle it. And so you can see the endoderm here. And so as you start to push in and form this inner layer, now you can have an inner layer or an endoderm, and then you can have an outer layer or an ectoderm. Meso means middle. And so the mesoderm is going to be in the middle between the ectoderm and the endoderm. And so, you, of course, you can see that right here. 
And so this is the beginning of cellular differentiation that's going to ultimately form different parts of the developing embryo. Now, when you have gastrulation, you can form some new cavities um, in the developing embryo. And you started with this one cavity, the blastocele, right? And so now you can end up with um, two cavities or even three cavities. And some organisms only form two, some organisms form three. How those cavities are formed is important. These are the, the details of embryological development that we use to infer relationships among these organisms. Um, and so that's the general development plan. And, and um, so everybody say hi. That was Dottie. Dottie thought she heard something. Anyway, um, that's the overall general development plan of animals. But looking at the differences between the groups helps us infer relationships among those groups. And so let's talk about that a little bit right now. This is what we're going to be using for the rest of the semester. So here's a figure from your book, figure 9.5. And it shows several different animal groups on the right. And you see how we separate these groups based upon how they develop. And so let's start with the simplest groups. Let's zoom in on this first part of the graph here. And so um, we start by noticing that um, some animals don't form those three germ layers. So we talked about the endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm. But there are some animals that don't produce those germ layers. Specifically, it's the sponges. The sponges um, don't undergo gastrulation. They don't produce those germ layers. And so that gives us a clue that the sponges are very different than other animals. Now, there are some organisms that undergo gastrulation, but they only form two of the germ layers. They only form, excuse me, they only form, uh, form ectoderm and endoderm. They do not form the mesoderm. And so since they only form two germ layers, we call those diploblasts, or they're diploblastic. Di is Greek for two, and so they only have two germ layers, so they're diploblasts. And so examples of these animals are uh, sea anemones, jellyfish, um, comb jellies, and so these are different phyla. But again, this is how we infer that these organisms are closely related but different than other organisms because they develop differently. Now, if we look at the diploblasts, this is a group of, organism that sh group of organisms that shows radial symmetry. And so um, they have a top and a bottom, but they don't have a left and a right. And um, we can also look at how their gut develops. And so you can see that when that gastrula forms, sometimes it pushes in. So you form this, this little pocket, but the pocket only goes halfway. It doesn't go all the way through. And so that ends up being what's known as a blind gut. And so this opening is both the mouth and the anus. And food comes in and wastes leave through the same opening. That's a blind gut. And so that's, again, things like uh, uh, sea anemones. Whereas in other diploblasts, this gastrula can push all the way through. And so then you can have an opening on either end, and that's a complete gut. So you have the food comes in one end and the waste go out the other end. And so you see that in things like uh, these cone jellies or, or other organisms. Again, looking at how the organisms develop gives us a clue to how they're related. Now, all the other animal groups we're going to talk about in here do form that mesoderm. So they form ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. And so they're called triploblasts, or they're triploblastic, because they form three germ layers. And whereas the diploblasts 
tended to show radial symmetry. The triploblasts tend to show bilateral symmetry. And so they have a head, you know, and a, uh, they, they have cephalization usually. They have a top and a bottom and a left and a right. And so we group those differently. And so, again, this is how we use embryology and development to just understand the uh, evolutionary history and the relationships between these groups. Now, we can take this a step further and we can look in more detail and we can look at how that mesoderm is formed in the triploblasts and that also gives us a deeper understanding of relationships among these animal phyla. And so here's another figure from your book. And um, it shows several different ways um, that, uh, that these organisms can develop here. Um, first off, what we want to look at is how these mesoderm cells are formed or what is the origin of that mesoderm. So we're talking about triploblasts. They form mesoderm, but where do they form it or how do they form it? Um, so they come from the endoderm, but sometimes in some of these organisms, they form down here near this opening, okay? And so where this opening occurs in the developing embryo, where that starts to push in and form an opening, that opening is called the blastopore. All right. Now, if your mesoderm forms down here near the blastopore, that's a group of animals that we call protostomes. Um, and so we're looking at how that mesoderm is formed that to, allows us to group a bunch of animal phyla into uh, this one big group called the protostomes. Now, if we look at some other triploblastic animals, we see that the mesoderm does not form down here by the blastopore. It forms up higher, and so it kind of pinches off. Now, they both come from that endoderm, but here the mesoderm forms in a different place. And so this group of organisms are called deuterostomes. All right, so it's a different group of organisms based upon how they develop. And so here is just another uh, slide comparing these two. You see the protostomes, the mesoderm forms down here near the blastopore. And in the deuterostomes, it forms up higher where it pinches off. And so by understanding this, we understand how different animal groups are related. Okay, so when you have organisms that form this mesoderm, the mesoderm can eventually form a whole new cavity, and this cavity is called the coelom. And so this is another clue to the development and the relationship among organisms. <clears throat> and so if we look here um, in the protostomes, sometimes they don't form a coelom. They form mesoderm, but not a salomic cavity. And so that's called the acelomate plan. And so you can see in this example, you've got this mesoderm, and the mesoderm starts down here at the blastopore, but it just fills up this whole cavity. And so you don't have a salomic cavity. Uh, sometimes you form what's known as a fake salome or a pseudo salome. That's the pseudo salomate plan. And so here you can see in these organisms, you can see that mesoderm forming down here, and it sort of rings the inside of the, the developing embryo, but that's a pseudo salome. That's not a true salomic cavity. But then in other protostome organisms, you see that the mesoderm forms and it makes these cavities by looping around on itself. You see how that mesoderm is growing and forming a cavity within the mesoderm? That is a true salomic cavity. And then as that cavity expands, you see it fills up 
the in interior of the developing embryo. And so, um, again, these are different ways that animals can develop based upon their evolutionary history. That's the protostomes. Um, in the deuterostomes, the deuterostomes, we always just get the true salome. And so here again, you can see their mesoderm is starting and it's forming in a different spot than the protostomes. And then when it forms, it loops around on itself and it forms a cavity within the mesoderm. That's a true salome. And that's the only way that you get um, a salome in deuterostomes. Okay, so now when you look at this uh, developing organism, you start to see you've got two cavities here. You've got the gut cavity, which is this inner part, and you've got this salomic cavity, which surrounds the gut. And so think about your body. Your body is organized in this way, right? You've got the gut cavity, which is open at both ends, right? It opens in your mouth and ends in your anus. But then surrounding that cavity, you have a salomic cavity. And that's where all your organs are tucked into that salomic cavity. And so this is how that all started when you were developing as an embryo. Okay. And so again, these different developmental patterns um, help explain the body plan. So that helps to explain like why your body, you know, has a salomic cavity and a gut cavity. And it gives us insight into evolutionary relationships. And so, uh, again, we can look at characteristics of these organisms and how the development is different between these different organisms. So, for example, um, in the protostomes, that blastopore is going to become a mouth. And you can see that right here. Whereas in the deuterostomes, the blastopore is going to become the anus. And this is actually where we get the term proto, uh, protostome from. Proto always means first, right? Like the prototype is the first type. And so a protostome, stome uh, means mouth or eat. And so protostomes are where the mouth forms first. And then later, the anus forms. Whereas in deuterostomes, the anus forms first, and then later the mouth forms. And so again, it's a very different way of developing, which suggests very different evolutionary relationships. And that's what I just said. Proto means first, protostome means first mouth. The mouth developed first. Um, we can also look at how the guts are different, and that helps us um, understand evolutionary relationships. And so um, we can see that we often have uh, blind guts, or sometimes we have blind guts, where the food and the waste go through the same opening. Um, but often, more commonly, we have complete guts. Um, and so where the food and the goes, comes in one opening and the waste goes out a different opening, um, the complete gut is the classic, what we call a tube within a tube form. And so if you think about your body, you're a tube within a tube, right? The inside of the gut is technically outside of the organism, right? So if you swallowed something, you know, if you swallowed, like you're a kid, you swallow a quarter or something, what do you do? Well, just wait and eventually they poop it out, right? Whatever goes in your mouth can move through and come out the other end. It's never technically inside your body. It's not really inside your body until it crosses that intestinal wall. Then it becomes inside your body. So that's just another way that animals can develop. Um, and so the bottom line is that by understanding these, embry these development patterns and these embryos, it tells us a lot about how the organisms develop. Uh, it tells us a lot about their form, and it tells us a lot about their relationships. And so just as an example here, um, this is a picture of a sea urchin. And if you've ever been scuba diving or, or, or snorkeling in the ocean, you've probably seen these, right? And if you looked at this organism, you would not think that it's closely related to vertebrates and to chordates, right? You would not think this is a close relative. However, if you look... <clears throat> at their 
uh, embryology, you see that these are deuterostomes, and they develop much in the same way that we do. And as their larvae, they have bilateral symmetry, much as we do. And it turns out that these are um, a very close relative to us. And so that's something that you would not ever understand if you didn't look at the embryology. Okay. Um, so I've got a cool video that I saw online of a developing new embryo. I'm going to show that to you in class. And it shows you can kind of see these steps as it develops. So that's pretty cool. So we'll look at that in class. Um, otherwise, that is uh, all I have on this topic. This is just a foundation here. We're going to use these ideas throughout the rest of the semester as we talk about the relationships among the different animal phyla. So let me know if you've got any questions, and I will see you later.